Thank you for joining us for this Committee on Public Safety, Intergovernmental and Military Affairs on this three o'clock on this Wednesday, April 5th in room 225. This uh, hearing is being streamed live on uh, YouTube. If they have, we have any kind of technical issues, well, we will put a notice as to when we would reconvene, but cross our fingers, that's never happened uh, so far this session. Uh, just for housekeeping, we would like to keep everyone's commentary uh, to two minutes. Uh, that's going to be our limitation on those who are going to uh, testify and we are going to have all those who are, have submitted uh, testimony and have expressed an interest to testify speak first and then we'll bring the nominee on uh, after that. So members we're on GM 517 submitting for consideration and confirmation as the Director of Department of Public Safety Governors nominee Tommy Johnson for a term to expire on December 7, 2026. On our testifiers list, and I'm gonna read those who have expressed interest in um, testifying in person. We have a lot of written commentary, both in support and a little bit in, in opposition. But uh, first on our testifiers list is Jordan Lowe from the Department of Law Enforcement. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Jordan Lowe, uh, the Director for the Department of Law Enforcement. I submitted a written testimony uh, in support of Mr. Johnson uh, to be the uh, Director for uh, Public Safety. Uh, I just wanted to add um, that I have worked with him for the past three years uh, when we were both Deputy Directors for Public Safety. I've always found him to be very professional very passionate about his job and uh, that he's considered a subject matter expert in the area of corrections and rehabilitation. Um, the only other thing I, I would like to acknowledge is his military service. You know, he's, uh, he's actually a very humble person. I didn't realize that he had received the Bronze Star for his ser service uh, in the Middle East. So I want to commend him for that. Um, Thank you very much. I'm available for, for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowe, or Director Lowe. Fred Hoon from the Paroling Authority. Good afternoon, Chair Wakai, Vice Chair Elefante, committee members. It's my pleasure and honor to testify before the, commi the committee today in strong support for the governor's nomination, Tommy Johnson, Director of Public Safety soon to become Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I'm blessed to be in such a position, having to testify today, having experienced the evolution of corrections from a division to a department with nine different directors and serving as acting director myself. Let me begin by saying that in 2003, based on secondhand and thirdhand rumors and innuendos. I was not a fan of Tommy Johnson. In 2016, I began as chair of the Hawaii Proling Authority, and Mr. Johnson was a Proling Partners Administrator of PPA. Although we had different styles of management, we worked as professionals very intensely together on a daily basis. Mr. Johnson's tenure as PPA and twice as Deputy Director of Corrections, DEPC, his administrative skill set, as well as servicing numerous parole boards and chairs, I can now say is exemplary. In 2020, with the onset of COVID and the retirement of then Director Espinda, Governor Ige assigned me the task of Special Master Troubleshooting Evaluate the Department and System followed by two months as acting director to assemble a team for his approval to address the crisis and move the department forward. One of the team members was Tommy Johnson, who was deputy director of corrections. Max Otani was appointed as the director. Mr. Otani and Mr. Johnson both come from backgrounds of parole and pardons, community supervision and reentry, as well as pretrial relating to jails. But more importantly, they served as since as Deputy Director for Corrections under different administrations. That provided the groundwork for rehabilitation and reentry. So I can say with a high degree of experience and authority, believe Mr. Johnson has demonstrated himself to me 
and others to be highly qualified and capable to serve as public safety director. I'll be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoon. Don Chang from DLNR has submitted testimony in support. Corey Renke from the Hawaii Paroling Authority. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. I'm Corey Reiki. I'm the, currently the Acting Paroles and Parts Administrator of the Hawaii Parole Authority. I've had the privilege of working um, with and under Mr. Johnson since 2003 as a parole officer, then as a parole supervisor, supervising the highest risk offenders in the state of Hawaii, uh, then as the uh, field branch administrator. I feel that Mr. Johnson has the knowledge and dedication to move this um, department forward, and I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reiki. DLNR. Aloha, Senators. Uh, Laura Ka'akua, Deputy Director for DLNR. Uh, Mr. Johnson has uh, personally assisted our department recently with some very serious public safety concerns around the Kalani Moku building. And we found him to be um, very attentive, very responsive, and very collaborative in working with other departments. So we do strongly support. Mahalo. Thank you, Laura. Pamela Ferguson Brigg from the Crime Victim Compensation Commission. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members. Um, Pam Ferguson Brigg, the Executive Director of the Crime Victim Compensation Commission. Thank you for um, providing an opportunity for me to speak in strong support of uh, the confirmation of Tommy Johnson as the uh, Director of the Department of Public Safety. Um, we believe that Tommy balances this, a strong commitment to justice reform um, by giving an offenders um, a real chance to be successful in re their reintegration by his commitment to evidence-based programming and treatment, while at the same time ensuring that corrections policies are informed by the needs of victim survivors and community safety. So we think this really is the perfect balance for somebody who's the director of this um, program because that's really what the community needs. They need to, to, to know that we're doing everything that we can do to make sure that people don't reoffend. Well, at the same time, um, when there are policies that are made that the director's thinking about um, our community safety and victims and survivors. I've had the privilege of working with Mr. Johnson um, in his tenure with HPA and uh, PSD over more than 20 years. And in that period of time, he's consistently sought out and acted upon the recommendations of victims um, and community safety. Um, first, by um, having a strong commitment to accountability for offenders through restitution, um, victim and community safety through the SAVIN Victim Notification Program. Um, and currently, um, we're working together with him on wraparound services um, for victims and survivors. The restitution project um, that we've worked on since uh, 2003 is a national model. Um, the Council of State Governments in our program published an article about um, you know, making sure that victim, victim, victim restitution matters. And quarter directed restitution does matter to Mr. Johnson. For, for many victims, it's often the only way that they see that the criminal justice system worked with them through restitution. Um, this project also re received an award from Eric Holder in 2013. Um, and tomorrow we're consulting with um, Marilyn on the program with, with Tommy Johnson's staff and our staff and, and what it takes to create a program that really can be victim centered. Um, the victim notification system, um, Tommy Johnson got federally, fe federal funding for that in 2008. It subsequently became a permanent project and it ensures that the statutory obligation of PSD to notify victims about offender movement so that victims can you know, make sure they have safety planning, that they know about if there's an escape um, or a death of an offender, that, they, that this system notifies um, them of that. Um, Corrections-based victim can, services. Can you summarize? Yes, um, Corrections-based victim services. We're currently working with him on a project to ensure wraparound services for crime victims um, post-conviction. So we strongly urge you to um, to confirm Mr. Johnson. We think he'll be an excellent director for the Department of Public Safety. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Melanie Martin from the Department of Public Safety. Hello, Chair Wakai, Vice Chair Elefante, and members of the committee. My name is Melanie Martin, and I am the Deputy Director for Administration with the Department of Public Safety. I stand on my written testimony in strong, exuberant, unequivocal support for Mr. Tommy Johnson for his confirmation as a Director of Public Safety. 
Unlike Director Jordan Lowe, he is not the George Washington of public safety. But when we move to and transition to the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, he will be the George Washington for DCR. Moving forward, he is the ideal candidate because he is the visionary. I think he's more like Abraham Lincoln, to tell you the truth, because like Abraham Lincoln, well, I didn't know him gay, I'm old, but not that old. So like Abraham Lincoln, he comes from humble beginnings, starting as a youth corrections officer, working his way up the ladder to the position he has today. And like Abraham Lincoln, he is honest. He has integrity and you, he's forthright. Always making the, a decision, whether right or wrong, he's decisive. And finally, he's like Abraham Lincoln because he's a servant leader, answering the call to serve. And I am so proud to serve beside him. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for paying attention to all the comments in this committee. <laughs> yeah. Going from George Washington to Abraham Lincoln. Fantastic. Uh, DeMont? Hello, my Kako. My name is Dimon Kalai Manole, and I'm the uh, co manager of Omanapon LLC, the Native, Av Av Native Hawaiian Advocacy operating out of the Wanai Post. We advocate for Native Hawaiians and prisoners because I come from the prison system. And I can tell you, in my 28 years of experience in the prison system, I would never have thought I would ever come here to support anybody to be director of the Department of Public Safety, but I do support Tommy. And I learned to say this. Just recently, I went back in for another seven months. It was Tommy Johnson who signed a arrest warrant to send me back in. <laughs> and yet here I am supporting a guy, because it wasn't personal. And I needed that seven months to recalibrate and get my life refocused. And I got remarried, so I my wife Michael here. And um, we support Tommy. And, and I tell you this because we recently, used, um, one of our guys passed away. All of us that was in a high security facility, 90 of us, one brother just passed away. And when I went to his service, um, Jermaine Kaupuni um, Bush, I asked everybody, I support Tommy Johnson for director, what you guys think? And they thought I was crazy. But then when I told them why, they understood. So I hear not only on myself, but also on behalf of a lot of us guys who was labeled the baddest of the bad in our state, in the high security facility, which William Oakley's father was the warden. <laughs> and I tell you that we all stand in support of Tommy because he's changing the system. The status quo is now ended. We now have a new system that really does believe in rehabilitation. Tommy was the head of the paroling authority. He understands about rehabilitation. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I believe that Tommy has what it takes to take his job to another level. And because the union opposes it, it tells you that the status quo is now dead. I thank you for my, my opportunity. Sorry, so I did I did submit written testimony, but I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I come on all day. So I, I don't know Tommy Johnson personally, but I have heard stories of him, good and bad, obviously. Um, but the few conversations that I did have with him, um, the, the fact that he's talking about rehabilitation and non-recidivism, that's a big thing to me because I think one of the main things is a lot of guys like Demont, um, in his situation are the most misunderstood people and they just need support in different ways. And I believe that Tommy Johnson will be able to do that. He understands that. Thank you. Strong thank you. support. All right, thank, thank you. Guys. Good to see you guys. Thank you. Alan Johnson from Hinamauka has submitted to- oh. our testimony, strong support. Thank you, Alan. Linda Rich from the Women's Prison Project Senators. <clears throat> um, we're submitting comments from the Women's Prison Project. Um, I want to start, first of all, by acknowledging the legislature for its support of significant efforts in the past few years to move the correction system from being more rehabilitative, especially for women. Um, we've established the Women's Court, the Women's Correction Implementation Commission, and supported restorative justice and educational opportunities for incarcerated women. 
In the past, the Department of Public Safety has not always supported these efforts. And sadly, there is still a, the reality that our prison facilities are in a deplorable state, many of them understaffed, and our recidivism rates are among the highest in the nation. Um, and the state recently paid out millions related to sexual assault committed in WCCC. Um, we need a champion of reform and transformation of the correction system to one that, that is truly effective in rehabilitation and prevention of recidivism. The new director must take the DPS, must make the DPS live into its name change of Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. As stated in our written testimony, um, we have found Mr. Johnson to be accessible and responsive when we've reached out to him, and we truly appreciate that. We are greatly encouraged by the hiring of an extremely qualified woman warden for WCCC. We would like to hear Mr. Johnson articulate his understanding of the problems and deficits within the system and his vision for transformational change, two characteristics that we see as essential to providing leadership in moving Hawaii's prison, uh, prisons forward. Thank you for hearing our comments and we trust the committee's wisdom in determining the outcome of the hearing. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Rich. Kalani Warner. Sorry. <laughs> well, stay away from the microphone so I'm not talking so loud. Uh, good afternoon, committee chair. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Kalani Warner. I am the state director of United Public Workers Local 646. I'm also sitting here on behalf of the 13,000 members of United Public Workers. As you heard earlier today, uh, we had given written testimony to uh, oppose the appointment, which I still stand with. And it is concerning to hear a union and the directors to take the seat to stand opposed on against another director. But a union leader must take guidance from his members. I started from the line, all the way to the ranks, got to the sergeant, and then I got more involved with the union to sit here today. I am here today to answer any questions you have. Because not only as a union leader, I can share with you factual grievances that are being ignored by this current department, I can also give you background as a line staff for 20 years, not only with his current position as DEFC, but his previous positions as leader and other times he held the same position. I'm available for you folks to answer any questions. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for joining us, Kalan. Max Otani has submitted testimony in support. Rosalina Ipopo. Has. Thank you, Rosalina. Uh, Keith Reagan has submitted testimony support. Dennis Dunn. Oh, oh, like magic. There's Keith Reagan. Hello, Chair, Vice Chair, members. Uh, stand on my, I sit on my testimony and support of the candidate. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for running in here to say that. Um, Dennis Dunn. And that's all I have for those who have expressed online an interest to testify on this um, GM. Is there anyone else here that would like to, um, oh, just one second, and then we'll get to Mr. Dunn, and then we'll get to you. Mr. Dunn. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Chair and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of the nomination of Tommy Johnson for the Department of Public Safety. I've worked with Tommy Johnson for over 20 years. As you can see from the written testimony, I believe he has many accomplishments. He has many good qualities that you're looking for in a leader for public safety. He listens and he can learn. He worked with us in the victim community for these 20 years to help set up the SAVIN system to learn and improve the process of communicating with victims along with the parole authority. And um, if Tommy doesn't know something, he'll tell you, but he'll find out. He's reliable. I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me, Chair Okai, uh, Vice Chair um, Elefante and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michael Hoffman. Um, 
I'm actually the institution's division administrator and presently I am now acting as the deputy director under Mr. Johnson. Um, I came to testify and, and just a little background on myself. Um, this is my 40th year in corrections. I've seen the good, I've seen the bad, and I've seen the ugly. Uh, I can actually talk to the uh, facts of the agency over this time period. Um, I worked my way up from the bottom to the top. I came to work under Mr. Johnson um, initially in 2008. Um, he was my deputy director. Uh, and then again, um, uh, under Max Otani as a director, Tommy came back uh, at a time where the department was in need for uh, leadership and um, assisting and, and moving us forward. Um, and now I serve for him as the acting deputy at this time. I can tell you he's an honorable guy. I think a lot of people misunderstand him. Um, as an ACO coming up through the ranks, I always thought I knew what could be done and what should be done. And I think that that has to be understood that um, there's a lot of people who believe there are certain things that can be done, but fully don't understand how large the system is, how complicated things are, how to get people at the table to resolve some of the greatest issues that we face. But I can tell you, Mr. Johnson constantly is engaged. He's open for discussion. Uh, I've never seen anybody who's more passionate about his job. Um, I think he really is a good person. <laughs> Uh, and I stand here in strong, full support. I've never came here before to testify for an individual for um, to be the director, um, but I think you guys should give him a chance. I, I, I do not think that you'll be disappointed in the end. He's the right guy for the job, and I stand in strong and full support. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Is there, yes. Yeah, I'm one of the guys, uh, my name is Daniel Tupuola. I'm one of the guys who was in uh, Jermaine uh, Bushnell's funeral. I did like 41 years in prison. I just got out like about three months ago. Yeah, Tommy Johnson, he's kind of like a hard guy, but at the same time, fair guy. Since I've been out, there's a lot of programs for a lot of guys. And guys like us, we do like outreach programs for a lot of kids, a lot of schools, a lot of gang members and everything, because I'm an ex-gang member, you know. So for me, for seeing all these changes, you know, because a lot of people don't believe one guy like me out here. So many people kind of like looking at me like, oh, but, uh, but because of the changes, you know, and uh, the tough love that they give, the tough thing that they say to them, you gotta make it, you know, and the support that they give the, the prison people, even though we out there, the parole officers and everybody, they kind of like talk to you, you know, and uh, I see this, I see this a lot, man. Even guys like us, that I see you guys outside doing real good program because I work too, you know, I work church and home. And a lot of people thinking that guys like us cannot even change. But I'm one of them guys that people look at it like, wow, but because of the prison system, giving that to us, you know, just letting you know, even though Tommy Johnson, but he's straight up. See, a lot of people kind of uncomfortable with that, but this is what we like, you know. He not gonna let BS people, he gonna tell you straight up, if you cannot, as you know, if people cannot handle it, that's not their thing then. But just we, us can we support him because of all. Uh, I'm out here, man, you know. For somebody for giving us a chance, give me a chance like that, I'm not supposed to see you over here talking to you. But like like a lot of kids that we go around school and talk to them come from the prison system, but we like doing that. We like, no matter what, we still give that a law. Plenty of people say they know a law, but still get a law, you know. We get a law for everybody, you know. I never thought I had that. I mean, I was on, one guy was on, uh, one of the worst of the worst. You know, I was on dangerous guy. But now I'm out here, I turned out the other leaf, you know, so I just thank, thank God, thank everybody for uh, letting me be here. Because I see everybody, I know everybody over here. But now they're looking at me, because they never know this is me coming over here. But uh, just to talk to you, let you guys know, you know, uh, he doing, he going to do a good job. You know, for him, for, for giving guys like us a chance, because a lot of people in, lose faith on us. But now we're coming out here, we're showing that, hey, and giving, especially to our kids, you know, and our kids, they cry. I mean, a lot of them, you know, and we tell them, hey, because of the prison system giving us guys a chance, we go all over the schools, you know, in for mass program and everything, but we're not gonna give up on that because they never give up on guys like us, 
you know. We was like, oh, scars. That's like us supposed to be dying in prison. But they're so happy and faithful. I mean, they cry. Kids cry, you know. Daniel, please thank, summarize. Thank you very much. You know, I appreciate it. Thank you. God bless. Sure. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, oh. Hello. Hello, Chair. Vice Chair. Members of the committee. Uli Omoko, Public Safety Deputy Director. I mean, full support of Mr. Johnson for the directorship on the public safety. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Is someone? Yep. Oh, that's a sign. <laughs> Hopefully that's a good sign. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm um, I am Galanta. I'm the new warden of the Women's Correctional Facility, and I strongly support Tommy Johnson. Um, a little bit about myself: I did 32 years in the state of Wisconsin at, uh, for the Department of Corrections, coming up through the line, starting and then ending my career, retiring as a deputy warden. And the short time that I've been here, Tommy has always been open. Um, I've had plenty of discussions with him and his vision, I'm going to be on his team. Um, that's how I feel, how strongly I feel that in order to change this department, you have to have people in the right places. And I believe that he is a true leader and a visionary leader that will lead the Department of Rehabilitation into a level that I believe the state of Hawaii has never seen. And um, for me, I'm going to be on that team. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Galante. Is there anyone else? I think someone was outside that wanted to join us. Hey, yes, it's your moment. So I'm just gonna read from here. <laughs> Two minutes, please. Okay. Ladies and aloha, chair and esteemed committee members. My name is Daryl Wilcox and I am the current president of the United Public Workers Union as well as a correctional officer at the Oahu Community Correctional Center for over 25 years. I'm here today to express my opposition to the selection and confirmation of Tommy Johnson as director of the Department of Public Safety. We require a person of action who can make sound decisions, not someone who is not transparent, makes excuses, and is passive. Our department has long been plagued by leaders who are unaccountable, irresponsible, and unresponsive to the needs of our staff and facilities. At OCCC, we are currently facing a staffing shortage of over 100 line officers, let alone our whole state, which has resulted in 24, 32-hour plus shifts. There have been uh, reports of 72-hour marathon shifts also. While our officers and staff have admirably kept OCCC afloat, they are exhausted from waiting for relief from TSD graduated officers or emergency hires. Despite submitting free emergency hire applications over six weeks ago, not one, not even one application has been approved to work yet. Under Mr. Johnson's watch, our training leader, Marty, was found to lack necessary credentials, and the highly reported Kulani Correctional reports of staff burning files and paperwork is concerning. Regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic, our COVID nurse, Kathy, has resigned as of April 1st, 2023. She was responsible for managing the daily account of COVID exposures, processing and housing inmates, and making recommendations on COVID-related issues. The last printout we received on COVID housing was last year. Module 7, the unit where we, hold, we house positive, positive tested inmates, has now become a special management unit. While the CDT, CDC has jurisdiction over COVID, our facility cannot decide whether we should wear a mask or not. We are told it's up to you. While inmates are ordered to wear masks outside the housing unit, creating confusion and inconsistency. Our staff was the first to battle COVID. We were left to fight it alone as leadership looked the other way. It took donations from ourselves and other entities to acquire supplies and sanitizers. Our very own UPW state director contracted COVID and nearly lost his life. Others like our Sergeant Matt um, and Neil Moto and Sergeant Salanoa from Halaba also succumbed to COVID's death grip. Although they survived, their experiences were heartbreaking. Mr. Wilcox, can you summarize? Please? Okay, I'm going to summarize. I've been here for 25 years. This current administration and there have been a lot of missed cues which will continue if the status quo is allowed to continue. I'm testifying not for the Department of Rehabilitation, but against the Department of Retaliation. For my testimony, I expect to be retaliated against, but I put myself out there to protect the brave men and women that put on the uniform every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Oh, your folder.
prepared for this, but um, oh. my name is Lieutenant Dan Newcomb. I'm from OCCC. I've been there 36 years. Um, I'll tell you right now, my friend would be proud of me coming up here to stand up for what I believe in with, with the guys out there. My friend Nolan Espinda gave his life for this department. He trusted people under him, including Tommy Johnson and some of these people in here, and he died for it. Okay, right now, it's all good and, and well that these guys are here for him because these are the higher echelon guys. What about the men below? Nobody comes and talks to anybody. They keep our mouths shut. Okay, we need, you guys, we all complain about Old Boy Network. We need to get rid of the Old Boy Network. Start new. Get a commission to take care of corrections and the Department of Public Safety. That's what we need to oversee. Not just have the well, department head running. The HPD has the same thing. Okay, you guys need to do that. Okay. I don't know, Tommy, but I've been there 36 years. I know, I know a lot of people sit, sitting behind me. But I am not in support. We need to clean house. Top. Starts with the top. Start anew. I know it's going to be rough, but start anew from now on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newcomb. Is there anyone else who would like to share their thoughts on Tommy Johnson? Hello, my name is Tracy Coriel Jr. I'm a corrections officer at OCCC and have been for the past eight years. In 2019, I was accused by an inmate at OCCC of sexual misconduct. I was detached to the Halava Correctional Facility for a period of approximately seven months. I was cleared by the Internal Affairs Division and returned to OCCC, completely cleared, receiving a form stating that the allegations made against me were unsubstantiated and false. A form signed by administrators under Tommy Johnson a year later was served the grand jury indictment on the exact same allegations that was served the bench warrant where I surrendered, posted bail, and returned to work later that evening. From that moment until now, that case is still pending. I'm expected to appear for trial call on April 18th. Explain this story due to the fact that when I attempted to gain legal representation for the Attorney General's office, I was informed by Shelley Harrington, an office administrator under Tommy Johnson. I was not to receive any legal representation due to being found not guilty of my charges, only by technicality. <clears throat> Sorry. Um... I was then forced to pay out of pocket for my own legal representation. When I reached out to the department, I was told to go to the trial process and await clearance or judgment. Approximately a year ago, I was served with a civil lawsuit where myself and the Department of Public Safety was to be sued by the complainant who originally claimed sexual misconduct against me that I was cleared from. It was only after this lawsuit that the Department of Public Safety decided to offer legal representation by the Attorney General's office. The entire process that I've gone through at this point shows complete incompetence on the part of the entire department starting from the top, Tommy Johnson. Now I fight another challenge where I was allowed to apply for the sergeant position at OCCC, passed the test, and was denied the position on the ground that I have a pending criminal case. A case, if I, if I can remind you all again, I was cleared from by the department. Seeing Tommy Johnson face to face now and seeing where my support has never came from is enough for me to know that if this individual, maybe all the things you, got, you all say he is, none of that matters if you don't support your greatest asset in corrections, the officers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there anyone else wishing to make commentary on this nominee? Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair. My name is Shea Moe Matsumoto. I work at Oahu Community Correctional Center. I'm a corrections supervisor. I've been there for 27 years now. Started my career there in uniform and then I decided to move over into the civilian side. And now I supervise social workers and I am the supervisor at the Work for Love program. I'm here not in support or not in support of Tommy Johnson. I'm here because I think we need change. I've been working at this one facility my entire career. I've dedicated all these years here. And as I was coming up in uniform, there came a day that I wanted to change I wanted to start climbing the ladder. I wanted to go back to school. So that is one of the things that's afforded to us sabbatical. So I had requested a sabbatical back in 2008 and I was denied because I hadn't put in the correct paperwork, the correct documentation. So that was a quick fix. I redid it and I was denied again. And this time I was denied because I was a female. So had I known back then what I know now, I would have taken that to another step. 
but I didn't. I went ahead and did it on my own. I finished, I changed, and now here I am before you, and I'm asking you to give change a thought. If it doesn't work, we can always go back and try something new, but our department is famous for not trying new and more innovative ways to get with the times with corrections in our nation. You know, we send a lot of our good administrators out to see how corrections is progressing in other states. A lot of good ideas, never implemented. Uh, what the person before me did uh, touch on with line staff, ACO security. Without them, what are we as supervisors? We are not the ones that are in the housing units. We're not the ones actually handling all of our detainees. Um, it's them. And we need to make sure that we keep the status quo. 16, 24, 32, 48 hour shifts. You cannot tell me somebody can do that and keep everyone safe. Inmates, staff, civilian staff is not trained to handle that. You know, our administration it's has also, you could summarize, yeah, please. they've also done things that are not what is allowed in corrections. We all know that. But what I'm doing is I'm here, not saying I don't support, but I want you to change things. Help them change and let us go back to corrections as we all know it can be. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Ms. Fosmore. Again, is there anyone else wishing to testify? Maybe we'll give a few seconds and help. Oh, yes. Good afternoon, committee. Good afternoon, Aloha. Aloha, guys. My name is Sergeant James Warner. I'm our uh, Oahu Community Correctional Center. I'm here to testify that I'm not in support of Mr. Johnson. Back in uh, three years ago, I went before the acting chief and our administration about this COVID that was coming down. And I told them, we got to activate now. We got to set gay masks, getting all these things together. I was denied. They told me, Sully, don't worry, nothing will happen. We're going to wait and see. I started sewing masks, guys, for our officers. And I brought my examples here today. After my mask was out, I, when my wife sewed it, we gave it to each of our officers. I took out the filters from the AC units, which I purchased, and put them inside here just for protect our officers. My housing unit at OCCC, the holding unit, was the only one that was COVID free the entire time. Because as soon as guys came in that was positive, I removed them. I cleaned the cell by myself with my officers, Clorox the walls, wiped down everything, lights out everything, just to ensure that this whole battle we went through. After everything was done, this is what the state provided us with. On Palaka, that don't even protect nothing because the thing doesn't seal your face. I've seen beforehand what this department, what this leadership has led us through. Again, like I said, I've been here for 23 years. My brother was the first officer at OCCC that was hospitalized, which is now our union director. I seen him get a massive, I seen him get on heart attack. Yet I couldn't be there for him. I have to stand on side. We could still continue to battle guys. I just got off. This week alone, 24 of 16 is all the way through. I just got off on 16 hour shift and I'm here today. Tired is crazy, but I gotta do what I gotta do to ensure that our facilities run the way it is. I'm one of the leaders and I'm proud to be a leader of my facility at OCCC. I'm here for any questions or another thing. A while back, they came through with this, the, this committee of senators and stuff, legislature. They came in. They did their spew. They didn't talk to us, but I was given a second to say something. After I was done, I was told, shut up. I'm trying to make you a better facility. I'm not scared of nobody. I've been in my, my position, like I said, for 22 years. I took the supervisor's position, and I'm going to be moving on. If I get retaliated against, no matter. I do everything. There's only one person I fear. That's the man of all. And I come work every day. And I've been here every day throughout COVID. And we're still fighting. Forget what we deserve. We're still fighting. Nobody there for us. I don't know how Lava coming down to help us out being shot staff. 
But summarize. our officers went up there. If you could summarize, please. Summarize. We'll be the same thing if you guys nominate it. We're going in the same direction. Thank you guys. Thank for you, Mr. Warner. Mahalo. Is there anyone else? Oh, yes. Hello, my name is Sergeant Carlos from Old Triple C. I've been there approximately 24 years and I'm in opposition for this appointment. Um, the first rule of leadership is to know your staff. And um, today there would have been much more staff here, but they're working and they're also very afraid of retaliation. It's, it's been throughout the facility that people that come forward to tell the truth get retaliated against. And our facility, I can't speak for other facilities I don't work at, is in grave danger. It's in, it's in a, it, the physical layout, the staffing levels, the burnout rate, the retirement rate, it's, it's a mess. And if something isn't done differently and immediately, I'm afraid of what COVID was handled terribly. This hiring process that's not happening is, is non-existent. Something needs to be done immediately. That's all I have. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else, perhaps outside? Okay. Give it like two seconds. Anyone outside or inside that wanna testify on this nominee? Okay. With that, uh, Mr. Johnson, if you could come up and maybe start by just giving us a little bit of your background and your vision for this department. Thank you, Chair and Vice Chair and members of the committee. Um, a little bit of my background, I grew up in Philadelphia. I'm one of eight siblings. Um, I joined the military, um, played sports all my life. That's why I have bad knees right now. Um, after I left the military, I uh, Moved to uh, Arizona, worked for the Department of Corrections in Arizona. Figured out 115 degrees during the summer is not for me. I moved here in um, August 21st of 2000, excuse me, of 1996. I started working for the state on March 25th of 1997. I've been in the state ever since. I started here as a youth corrections officer, went to work for the um, housing agency as a personal management specialist. Uh, from there, I uh, ended up leading that section, and I became the administrator for the Hawaii Polling Authority on 17 September of 2001. Stayed there until uh, June of 2007, when, when Governor Ningo asked me to be the deputy, deputy director of corrections. Stayed until December 2010. Went back to be the administrator for the polling authority until Governor Ike asked me in November, actually in October, to come over to be the Deputy Director for uh, Corrections, and I came over in November 2010, and I remained a Deputy Director until 30 November 2022, and I became a Director the next day. Uh, contrary to early testimony, I never worked for former Director uh, Espenda. He had Jody Miyasaki Hirata as his Deputy Director of Corrections, um, <clears throat> and then I've been the Director since December 1st of this year today. My vision for the Department of Public Safety is to create a department, <clears throat> a unified correction system that is efficient, effective, and designed to meet the treatment, education, or reentry needs of those sentenced to our custody and care. In addition, provide a safe and humane living condition to those in our custody and better working conditions for our staff. That's my vision for the department. Um, I, did, I do have some uh, open air remark comments I'd like to read. I think it will address some of the issues that are brought up here today. Um, again, good afternoon, Chair Wakai, Vice Chair Alaconte, members of the committee. As you know, I am Tommy Johnson, and I'm here to seek uh, the committee's support on advising consent on my nomination, Governor's Message 517, to become the Director of the Department of Public Safety. Thank you for allowing me to provide these remarks. Uh, I also want to first thank my family members and loved ones for their support, and in particular, my wife, Ronalyn, who's here with me today. Um, I also want to thank those in the audience support, who are here to support my nomination, those who couldn't be here but submitted testimony, and those here today in opposition for participating in the process. 
I am humbled by the governor's nomination and the support I've received from so many staff, uh, former coworkers, community members, leaders, and others. As you know, the department is clearly one of the most difficult departments to manage given the many challenges it faces daily. Overcrowding, antiquated and aged facilities, severe infrastructure woes, lack of sufficient funding, litigious clientele. However, despite the challenges that we face, many of which have been around for decades, PSD has some of the most dedicated staff statewide who sacrifice time away from their families, knowing that they could be held back for 16, 24, even longer hours. What some of the testifiers didn't mention to you earlier was that they're only being held over because we have an issue within public safety where there's a high call out for sick leave, a high number of staff that are on uh, approved FMLA, um, and I'll go over those stats uh, later on. In addition, for each one thing that goes wrong, say an offender walking away from work furlough on a pass, which makes the news, there are literally thousands of things that go right every day, including dozens of offenders returning from working in the community daily. Despite these challenges, our dedicated staff show up day in and day out, 24-7, 365 a year. For me, leading such a dedicated group of public servants would be an honor and a privilege. I see so much potential and opportunity in our staff, and I want to help guide the department to the successful transition from the Department of Public Safety to the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. This change is an ideal time to do a complete paradigm shift from what some may see as a punitive incarceration model to one that is focused on treatment, evidence-based programming, education, and successful reach-in wraparound reentry services. And what I mean by reach-in wraparound services is this. We do a good job of doing the assessment to determine a person's criminogenic needs when they come in, put them in the sequential phasing process to complete the programs. Unfortunately, because a lot of staff aren't showing up to work, some of those programs are canceled, so they get pushed back. However, what we need to also do is look at what are those things that individual needs to successfully transition, not just the education and treatment. I'm talking basic things, ID cards, uh, replacement social security guard, birth certificates. Would they qualify for TANF benefits? Would they qualify for Medicaid or Medicare? Would they qualify to rehab their uh, veterans benefits restarted or union benefits restarted? Those are the things we need to take the extra step and do. This will not be easy nor completed quickly and won't be done without challenges and possible missteps, but it must be done nonetheless. If I am provided with the opportunity and privilege to serve as a director, I plan to do so by being transparent, accountable, and by working collaboratively with interested parties. I was the only director in, that I can recall that sent, specifically sent out messages to all the staff telling them that I will not tolerate retaliation, harassment, or workplace violence of any kind so that they can come forward. As a result of that, I received all of these input from the staff. And so for, for some to say that I'm not responsive, for some to say that I don't care, that, I, that I'm not listening, that, that is incorrect. I am clearly engaged and I'm clearly trying to make the department better. And I'm putting in place a leadership team to affect the positive change that the staff needs. Now, not everybody may be happy with that, but the change is needed to change the direction of the department and change the work ethic of the staff. For too long, PSD has operated in a self-imposed silo, which has proven detrimental to having a modern approach to incarceration and rehabilitation, not to mention the harmful effects that it's had on the morale of our dedicated staff. And that's what some of the testifiers were alluding to. But I have to say that was under previous administration, maybe not under this administration for sure. As part of the changes, I willingly seek the input from the staff via open door policy, uh, staff can call me or email me directly, and I have sent out messages to PSD all requesting their input and notifying them, as I mentioned earlier, that I won't tolerate retaliation or harassment of any kind. Uh, this was done. This was done because I believe in openness, and because some staff expressed concerns about coming forward about issues of concern. So I told the staff they can contact me directly. Two staff folks out of three thousand contacted me directly, and we're co currently looking into those matters and concerns they brought up. My team and I will make every effort uh, to affect the positive changes needed to develop and implement a more efficient, effective, and rehabilitation-centered unified correctional system statewide. To do so, the department needs many things. We need to proceed with the planning and design of the new old CCCC. 
We need to update our master plan. We need to update our strategic plan. And we need to articulate our goals, priorities, and vision moving forward for a better and more responsive correctional system that is designed to meet the needs of those sentenced to incarceration and create a healthier and more positive work environment for our staff. This will take considerable dedicated long-term resources from the department, from the state, including the department maximizing leveraging of federal funds to assist this effort. I have already started leaning into this matter by ensuring that we review published federal grant solicitations weekly so that we don't miss any opportunities to augment some of that funding from the, state, from the federal government. Further, the state's use of incarceration should be a last resort and not a first option. Nonviolent offenses, including misdemeanor quality of life nuisance type offenses, urinating in public, disorderly conduct should be addressed in the community whenever possible. It should be noted, incarceration of those with mental health illness, even for short periods of time, is the least effective and most costly option and does not address the underlying illness, which in most cases is the cause of the person's involvement in the criminal justice system, and some may see it as criminalizing mental health illness. Jail populations are constantly changing daily, and jails across the country, including in Hawaii, are not staffed nor designed to provide long-term mental health treatment services to this, pop to this population. Much of the severe overcrowding the state has experienced is in our jails, not in our prisons, and is directly related to these issues and other social services related deficiencies statewide. It is my intention to chart a different path forward for the department, working with the administration, the legislature, the judiciary, Department of Health, Department of Human Services, the unions, other stakeholders, and our partners, and our staff on a complete paradigm shift needed to improve the overall correctional system in the state. As you know, the department will be splitting from the law enforcement come 1 January 2024. So the sheriffs, NED, executive protection for the governor, lieutenant governor, and other law enforcement entities will become the Department of Law Enforcement. So our current mission statement of the mission of the Department of Public Safety to uphold justice and public safety by providing correctional and law enforcement services to Hawaii communities with professionalism, integrity, and fairness doesn't fit. So with that said, uh, our new mission statement will be something like, now this is not final, but I will be working with the staff on it. The mission of the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation is to provide correctional, rehabilitative, holistic, and reentry services to persons sentenced to our custody and care with professionalism, respect, integrity, and fairness. With that said, thank you for allowing me to provide these opening remarks. And if you have any questions, I'm here to answer the questions, of course. And I do have information I brought with me on some of the information provided by previous testifiers. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Members, questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, I do have a few questions, so I'm happy to stop in between or if you want me to go. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, I do appreciate your testimony today and to those that have testified, uh, whether in support or against your nomination, mm -hmm. but I do appreciate your presence here today and for the comments that you made to address uh, some concerns that were raised. So you did mention that from since 97 that you've been employed at the Department of Public Safety? No, um, I, I arrived in the state on August 21st of 1996. I started working for the state of Hawaii on okay. the 25th of March of 1997. Seven. Okay. And then during that time, you did mention from 2007 to 2010, you were a deputy of corrections under the Lincoln administration? Correct. Okay. So having said that, um, and I know we talked about this uh, briefly, um, during that time frame, uh, I believe that there was a closure of the Kulani facility. That is correct. Okay. Um, were you aware of burning of documents and closure um, at that facility at that time? Yes. Okay. Now, if you were in that role as director, how would you have handled that situation? Well, um, first I'll tell you, if you don't mind, what factually occurred, and then I'll tell you where I think some serious missteps occurred. Okay. Um, first, um, uh, at that time I was a deputy director of corrections. Mr. Michael Hoffman was the um, institution division administrator. Uh, we were set up there by the director, Clayton Frank, on the 20th of July of 2008. 2009 to let them know the facility was closing, that the facility, that the governor was thinking about closing the facility to save $2.8 million in the budget. Um, uh, 
Uh, unbeknownst to us, the decision had already been made with discussions with Clayton Frank, the former Deputy Director of Administration, uh, Mr. David Festerling, um, and possibly the Director's Executive Assistant, uh, May Andrade, with the Governor or the Governor's staff, because on the 24th, four days later, uh, Clayton Frank made an announcement to General Lee, who was the Adjutant General at the time, that the facility was going to close. So that made it look like that Mr. Hoffman and I were untruthful with the staff when really we did not know. Uh, I think there was an unrealistic closure time schedule put in place where they wanted to close the facility by uh, October of that year. It ended up closing in December of that year. The problem with that timetable was the, the state had never closed the facility. That's the first thing. The second thing was there was no plan to close the facility. So we're trying to develop that. That's why we told it. I told Clayton Frank that it, it's an unrealistic schedule given that Kulani had been up there since it was a work camp decades and decades. It had accumulated so much equipment uh, and there was no way that we could close the facility, I think, in such a short period of time. Nevertheless, we tried to stick to the schedule. There were some missteps in that I did authorize the destruction of sex offender treatment material that I did not want shipped here, which was graphic sexual material that they use in the SOTP program up there. Somehow that morphed into uh, the staff. Uh, so I ordered those document, those materials burned, but inventory first, with the chief of staff, and uh, at that time, it was the Corrections Program Services Division Administrator, Mr. Frank Lopez. They inventoried them, they supposedly burned it up, the material in a 55-gallon drum. Somehow that morphed into staff burning duplicate records, not original records, that were decades and decades old that they should have destroyed in a different manner. As a result of that, uh, the department was fined $10,000 by the fire department. There was a hearing held by Senator Kokoban at the time, and I appeared before the hearing with Clayton Frank. And uh, what came out of that was that there was miscommunications from the director and the deputy director of administration by not communicating with the deputy director for corrections myself on what was really going on, uh, what the, the, the decision had already been made, um, and that I, there's a specific, we have the report if the committee wants, we can provide you the full report of that, of that uh, investigation. And I had early on in the closure process, I had recommended to Director Frank that we initiate an investigation against Warden Pete McDonald at the time, because he was not uh, doing the things he was supposed to do to, to bring the closure plan into fruition. He was actually hindering the closure of the facility. And I was against the closure of the facility because the $2.8 million made no sense because at the time the state was in the middle of a rift, up, rift um, and we had to then find places for these staff. So we had two people retire, if I recall correctly. The civilian worker went to work for the National Guard Youth Challenge Program. Everybody else got placed. So my argument to Director Frank at the time was, why would you close the most successful SOTP program in the nation when you had less than 3% recidivism rate for new sex offenses? And why would you give up the facility? Why didn't we just cancel programs? Because that made more sense to me because they, the government didn't end up saving anything because if I'm not mistaken, um, there was some issue with uh, gasoline, oil or contaminants in the, in the ground, which had to be dealt with, which if I'm not mistaken, took hundreds of thousands of dollars to clean up before the National Guard could actually move in and take over. And when we got the facility, when Parkland City got the facility back years later, they didn't get the 36,000 acres. They only got something like maybe 5,000 acres. So what happened to the other 37,000? So, so that's my recollect, rec recollection of what happened. And we do have the final report, which basically says the things I told you. And that request for the investigation for Pete McDonald was there. No, I appreciate your comments on that and recollection and sharing how you would have proceeded if uh, you were. I would not have closed the facility. No. That's just a bottom line. Thank you. Um, so you did hear from um, some members from the United Public Workers Union and some testimony mm -hmm. uh, regarding that. Um, I think even in addition to that, uh, you heard from one testifier saying uh, he came from 16 hour shifts. So it's my understanding that some of the uh, COs have been working long hours so how do you plan to address uh, those issues with, you did mention about FMLA and, sure. and overtime and staff shortages, but how do you address you know, that in working with UPW? Okay, well, first, um, I, I did meet with Kalani Warner um, 
I, I initially texted him on the 9th of December after I became the director to meet with him. Uh, somehow we didn't connect until sometime in February we finally met. I told him that there were issues, uh, a lot of issues with the department and I wanted to work with him. He admitted at a meeting that some of his staff just weren't coming to work and that's what busted the problem. So I want to make it clear. While we do have vacancies, we schedule enough people to come to work. The problem is an inordinate amount of staff are not coming to work because they're either on FMLA or they're calling in sick. So first, let me address the issue of the uh, vacancies. Um, I came on board in November 2020. I came on board because at the time, the department was on fire with COVID and they needed leadership and direction. Um, and OCCC was the worst facility at the time with COVID. Um, we were able to get the, the uh, PPE um, out of storage that the facility had been provided. It wasn't being handed out and they finally did uh, give it out. We were able to provide direction to the staff and we were able to bring COVID under control. Now, I want to make it clear though, with the jail, because of the population the way it is, it are, it's mostly the inmates of the detainees bringing the COVID in because it's such a fluid population. But the prison is normally the staff because the inmates aren't moving. So, give you some historical perspective. In 2018, the department held three BCT classes, which is a basic correction recruit class, 59 graduates. In 2019, they held two classes, 36 graduates. In 2020, take in mind, keep in mind, I came on board in November. There's only one class held that graduated in July of that year, five months before I came on board, 37. In 2021, in the middle of COVID, we were able to hold two classes and had 61 graduates. In 2022, we held four classes, 96 graduates. In 2023, we've now had one class graduate 12 pending, we're going to hold two more classes. So in the past two and a half years, I've increased the number of corrections officers on the floor 50% from 2018 to 2020 is 122, six classes. From 2021 to 2023, there's 171 graduates, 12 are pending for 183, that's 50% more. We still got two more classes this year. And I've already ordered the TSD Training Services Division to hold at least four classes next year and possibly five, even if they overlap. So we're trying to get ahead of the, of the um, vacancy issue. The problem the department did with vacancies was back in 2017 or 18, they asked DHERD to do a study, Department of Human Resources Development, and DHERD predicted this silver tsunami of people retiring. So at that time, the department should have ramped up the classes, the BCT, so they would have people on the ground. They, they did not, for whatever reason, I don't know, I wasn't part of the department. I didn't know about all this until I came on board. And that's why I immediately ramped up the classes to start to address the vacancy issue. With respect to the, um, with respect to the ACO's um, leave status. So I'll give you an example here. We have a, a 1,535, uh, authorized ACO position statewide. And I have to say that is larger than the entire judicial branch of government statewide. So that is huge to manage something like that. We have 13, 1,230 positions filled, which is a 80%, 80.3% fill rate. Our vacancy rate is 19.7%, 302 vacancies. However, of that, 434 officers or 35% of the filled positions have approved FMLA and are able to take off. So what happens is an officer will get approved family leave for their mother, then the father, then the wife, then the child. And so they can use that any time to say, I, I can't stay, I'm not coming to work. The state of Hawaii is generous. We have the best benefit package in the nation. 168 hours of vacation, 168 hours of um, sick leave, that's literally more than two months an employee can take off. The average corrections officer who's the earner burner is coming to work about seven months a year. The rest of that time, those posts still have to be filled. So the guys are getting stuck and that's why you have the long shifts. And so I wanna work with TPW to figure out, anybody can point out the problem, but what is the solution? We need to work together on a solution. How can we provide an environment where we want the staff to come to work, where they wanna be there? I'm looking at things like um, reducing the number of hours they have to spend at the BC, at the basic corrections officer class um, by at least three weeks, providing we have a robust OGT, OJT program in the facilities. That would get them on the floor faster. 
we were looking at changing the uh, PAT test, the physical agility test, to a co-PAT test, a correctional officer agility test, which I believe will uh, allow us to have more folks pass. So we're looking at a lot of options. I even talked to the director of DHERD and my deputy director for administration and corrections about looking at providing hiring bonuses to new employees and looking at give providing half the bonus when they finish the class, half the bonus when they're on the job for a year and look at longevity for the guys who got 15, 20, 30 years, but it has to be tied to attendance. Otherwise we're giving them more money not to come to work. So I'm willing to work with UPW. And when I met with Kalani Warner, I told him, did, did you have any objections to me? He said, no, Tommy, personally, I have no objections for you, but if my guys show up, I'll be there. I said, fine. I said, listen, I'm willing to meet with you or your members. Either I'll come here, you guys come to my office, I'll meet you somewhere in the public. I let, did not get one phone call from them. And I go to the facilities, and when I do, I speak to the staff there. And I do that every facility I go to, and I'm literally probably the only director who, and I was a deputy, the same thing. Since I, it's hard for me to get to the, to the um, facilities during the weekday. So I go to the facility sometime on the weekends, not to see, catch somebody doing something wrong, but to thank the people for coming to work on the weekends, but to also talk to them. Now, some people will engage, and sometimes they get an earful, and sometimes they won't engage. And I don't want to force them to engage, but I do want them to know that I'm there, and as a leader, I'm going through the facilities to talk to the staff. Yeah, appreciate that. And my last question, thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. Um, has several parts to it. Um, you talked about your vision and a little bit about your mission and what you're constructing mm -hmm. as you're going through this change uh, with DPS. So how do you, with that, how do you address the issues of overcrowding in our prisons mm -hmm. um, to mental health issues, to ID cards, and then overall a new jail? Okay. And how does that all fold into your vision and mission? Okay, so first, while we need a new old triple C, um, and we need to continue to plan and design, some of the immediate steps we need to do is to work with the judiciary and the DOH to, so they can step up and provide the services in the community. We pay approximately between $247 and $258 a day to keep somebody incarcerated. Whereas on parole, it's about $9.80 a day. Um, at the state hospital, it's over $1,100 a day. If we can, if we can work with the, the DOH and the DHS, and I say DOH because, because they're responsible for mental health services in the community. I say DHS because they're responsible for determination for benefits. If we can work with them, and I'm willing to do so, um, to, to make sure those community-based services are there, then we can do jail diversion. I'll give you an example, and I don't know if I mentioned this guy to you before or not, but you think about the criminal justice system as an iceberg, go over Kano, wherever you want to. At the very top, you have the Hawaii Coding Authority, 1,400 convicted felons on parole. They don't deal with misdemeanors. They all went through prison. Under HPA to the water line is public safety. About 4,100 folks in custody, pretrial misdemeanors, misdemeanors, sentence felons, parole violators, probation violators. About 2,200 of that are sentenced felons. Under the waterline is the judiciary, and I'm not speaking for the judiciary, but the judiciary has 25,000 people on probation, 13,000 sentenced felony probationers. If we're gonna change the system, we need to change the feeder to the system, which is the judiciary, which means the judiciary needs resources. They need programs, they need staffing. My job, I see as public safety is, they should come to us as a last resort. But when they come to us, we should be able to provide evidence-based programs and services for them for the people that want to change. That's our duty. They provide a safe place for them and we should provide the wraparound reentry services for them so that when they get out, we can reduce the recidivism rate and we get a better product, for lack of a better term. From the HPA standpoint, the HPA does a really good job supervising them and of the major criminal justice entities in the state, HPA has the lowest recidivism rate because they work with the offenders in the community. So my vision is that we have a, cor a unified correctional system that is responsive to the need of the offender, but also to the staff. And it won't be easy and it won't be cheap and it will take some time and there will be missteps, but we still must proceed no matter what. Otherwise we get the same thing. I saw kids as a youth corrections officer here that are now seeing the adult system. When I was a youth corrections officer, they had, they had uh, family members in the adult system. Now they're in the adult system. We have to break that cycle. We have to somehow. And we have to do that by 
other departments not working in silos either. Instead of instead of just working to figure out what their what their single mission is, like public safety used to do, we need to figure out how can we work together for the betterment of the community as a whole? Because if we can reduce recidivism, provide people with the skills to earn a living wage, not just a minimum wage, then we then provide them the tool to be successful and be productive members of society. I'm a law and order person, but I do believe we have a duty to help those people that want to change. And if some people want to keep the status quo and they don't want to look at themselves to see that there, there are issues they need to work on to fix, that's on them, but we still need to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Terrell Pike. I guess one area that I was particularly uh, concerned about, you know, with some of the testimony that came forward was the, the lack of COVID preparations and or supplies. Can you respond, you know, to some of the testimonies that were provided earlier? Because right. it sounds as though what you envision and what was being testified to are kind of at, uh, at odds. Uh, no, I think some of the testifiers were correct in that. When I came on board in November 2020, OCCC was already on fire with COVID. And Mr. Warner may have very well uh, been providing masks to the staff. But when we came on board, there were supplies to the facility that were not being given out. We provided N95 masks to all the staff. We provided cloth masks to the inmates, and they are required to wear the mask. So this this uh, statement that that they're being told that it's up to them, it's not up to them. Our pandemic policy requires every staff person while they're in the facility to wear the mask. And there is enough supplies there, and we made sure there was enough supplies. We worked closely with Haima to make sure we had not just the cleaning supplies, we had the mask, we had the jumpsuits up to seven extra large size, uh, seven extra large. And so we still have supplies. And so if staff aren't using it, then I will go back and talk to the wards and the deputy director for correction and see what is the miscommunication. Our pandemic plan is clear. There is no option that you don't wear the mask. Okay. Thank you. Any yeah, a couple of questions for you. Um, I guess the, for, I found your comments on the judiciary interesting. I mean, they do get all the uncontested traffic fines in the state of Hawaii. So they do have a, quite a healthy stream of, of resources. But, you know, I'm from Maui, you represent Maui, and our jail facility over there has been atrocious mm -hmm. for a long time. And I think it touches upon the grievances of the ACOs and the workers of the conditions, the infrastructure at the facilities. We've been having plans to try to build a new one out towards Puanene side, but there have been concerns coming that the department isn't going to provide the type of space and facilities for these wraparound services you're talking about. We've been talking about that new facility since Kulani, since I was here in 2008, mm -hmm. when that all that happened, and it still hasn't been built yet. And so, you know, we hear talk about a new facility you know, Oahu, which has been a lot of discussion and it still hasn't been talked about. I mean, I guess what is, is your role as a director? Are you going to do ensure that one, that there's a definitive timeline for these new facilities that come online? And what are you going to do to ensure that these new facilities, when they're built, will have the very same services that the providers themselves saying, you know, right now may not be able to be housed in that area. And I guess you received, you know, concern and feedback, but have you responded to all of them? I, I just got all this. I just sent that out the last mm -hmm. week. I got the, the responses in came in earlier this week. So I categorized them, separated them out by facility, and then we'll start going through them and whiteboard them mm -hmm. to start seeing. Now, the, the, the theme, I, I can tell you from what I have saw so far, and I explained this to Mr. Hoffman, was staff don't feel appreciated. They feel that their immediate supervisors, instead of giving them direction, they're trying to cover their ass. When really, that's what we pay them for. We pay them to give direction. We pay them to supervise. And so that those are issues I'll be addressing with them. The emails I sent out to the staff about coming forward, um, if they feel retaliated against, if they have issues to complain, I mean that, come forward. Yes, it's overwhelming to deal with them, but I think sometimes staff just want to be heard. But if they do have legitimate um, issues of concern, then we as the employer have a duty to address it. Now, with respect to the Maui facility, back in 2007, uh, they were already working on that when I was a deputy director the first time, and the state spent $12 million thereabouts in planning and design for the facility not to be built because it came in above $240 million. And um, I think that that's a huge waste. And I think too many times the state 
and whether it's uh, the legislature, lack of funding, or lack of vision on the part of the Department of Safety, or lack of planning and preparation with DAGs, I'm not sure, but the state can't afford to keep starting and stopping, starting and stopping, because when you do that, uh, cost escalation go up, so the facility costs more. And I do think we need to replace Maui. And in fact, we were gonna put the facility right above the National Guard Army, if I'm not mistaken, before. Um, by the time I left, that was still being discussed, but it, it was never built. And I think though, my vision for the Department of Corrections Rehabilitation is that before we provide a proposal to the legislature, we need to have our ducks in order. We need to have it. But I think what the legislature have to, have to understand is that, uh, and I'm not throwing DAGs under the bus, but agencies like DAGs who have to manage the contract need to hold the, um, the contractors and the consultants uh, feet to the fire when something goes wrong. And I'll give you an example. If a consultant gets something wrong and there's a there's a, an anticipated cost, but if that's what we're paying the expert for, then why are we still paying him and not penalizing an expert when clearly there was something that's foreseeable and he or she should have foresaw it, but now the state's on the hook and we get an insufficient fund notice, now we gotta pay another 1.2 million. Then we come back to the legislature and ask for money, it looks like we don't know what the hell we're doing. Well, you're the, they're gonna be the new director. You can hold your a friend there, Mr. Regan, who just came in accountable. I will I will certainly work with Keith on that because he and I have had a discussion about the cost escalation cost because like if you do a, a, a notice to proceed and it's late, then you're going to get the, co the escalation cost because the company is ready to go and you're not. So I was telling him, you have to you have to get the staff to hire to manage the projects appropriately. And I'm hoping that DAGs do get the staff they need because they do need staff. That I agree. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a few other sure. questions. I mean, it seems pretty evident that pe people in this room are your contemporaries. They all love you, they support you. People outside of this room, it's just a clear line on those who oppose uh, your, your nomination. And I'm trying to get to how you're going to remedy these. Uh, these stark differences mm -hmm. in opinions on your mm -hmm. leadership abilities. So I want to cite uh, some of the written testimony that uh, we got. We have um, someone from the Women's Correctional Center, ACO Uparesa, not going into the details here, but generally this individual says that uh, you have shown a practice of abusive power and favoritism. Uh, there was individuals at the WCC who were charged with, uh, they believe, unfairly, and the investigation into these individuals were not properly in investigated. There was another individual who said on the flip side, uh, you show favoritism to others who are in a supervisory commission. Uh, examples where there was a, uh, escapes during that person's watch, there's a discharge of a firearm during that person's watch. And then in that particular case, there were no reprimands for uh, holding that individual accountable. So we have folks that say that um, you're unfair on one side in going after folks and others who say you're overly favored, uh, you play favorites and those who should be held accountable <coughs> are not. How do, you, how do you respond to that? Well, first, I'm unaware of any discharge of a weapon where a person was not disciplined. Second, um, if, I, if I can explain the investigation and hearings process, I might lend some uh, light. If, if an incident occurs and someone believes that a violation of policy or the standards of conduct has occurred, then an, uh, the person is assigned uh, an investigator to complete the investigation. The investigation is completed and goes through the chief of security, through the warden, the institution of the administrator, to the deputy director of corrections, to me, and then it goes to a hearings officer. The hearings officer reviews it, makes a, re makes a recommendation with respect to discipline, if discipline is warranted and the level of discipline, and that then goes to the director for approval. So I think there's a misunderstanding as to how discipline is meted out and how the investigations, because the investigations are completed and there are cross checks and balances to make sure that the investigation is completed correctly and thoroughly. One uh, problem we do have in the department, and I've talked to our hearings folks and to Mr. Hoffman, is that too often I'm signing off and reviewing investigations where we, where we are 
um, negating some of the level of discipline because it's taken us too long to do the investigation. So I met with them recently and gave them guidelines and marching orders on timelines to complete investigations because when investigations linger, uh, morale goes down, you have a person in limbo, which is inappropriate, and people think that this person got away with it when really it's taking time. And, and to some degree, there were some people slow walking investigations for that purpose, that's gonna stop. I'm unaware of this issue of anyone discharging a weapon. And I think the people that work for me know that I don't show favoritism, I'm fair. And just as some of the um, previous testifiers said, I'm a, some people, I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but I'm fair and I'm consistent. I don't do favoritism, I don't do nep nepotism. No one can ever say that I did something unethical, immoral, or illegal. That's just how I am. What you see is what you get. And some people, that makes people uncomfortable because I'm pretty straightforward. And I would just tell those people, put on your big boy pants, because we're adults. The UP, UPW has uh, claimed that in their grievances uh, against public safety, they believe that they are winning more and more judgments that you know are in their favor. Is that true? And then if it is, why is that the case? Uh, I'm only aware of a, a couple of incidents. So it could be linked to testimony before an uh, HLERP hearing where a uh, public safety labor relations specialist indicated that part of the DAP, the, um, the new um, attendance program was a punitive process, but it was not. It is an administrative process where someone was allowed to have up to 15 periods of unauthorized absences, which I think is too many, uh, before action is taken. Um, and so they use that in, in um, future and grievances, if I'm not mistaken. But I, I want to make it clear that the union files grievances even when we follow the letter of the law of the contract. Because according to UPW itself, that they file the grievances because they don't want their members reporting them to the national organization. And so they file the grievances, which to me is a complete waste of time and effort. If you know your member is wrong, tell them they're wrong. Work with the employer to fix the behavior and let's move forward. You know, in your, question, your responses to Senator Elefante about just this morale issue and some misunderstandings between your admin and uh, the ACOs, uh, you talked about paid family leave and pretty much pointed to some of the abuses that you've seen. And I find it astonishing that we have uh, ACOs that may only work seven months out of the year because maybe they're, they're gaming the entire uh, process here. You know, considering the lack of uh, coverage that you have and the fact that it's evolved into people having 16, 40, 72 hour shifts, how much of that is the responsibility of UPW? I think UPW, they recognize that there's a problem because when I met with Kalani Warner, he admitted that he told the guys, you got to come to work. So what happens is if, if I'm on a post and I don't show up, that post has to get filled. So they're filling it with somebody by holding them over or calling somebody in who's a day off. What I've instructed uh, the deputy director for corrections to do is if you got to hold somebody over, then you hold somebody over who's finishing the fresh eight, meaning the guy who just finished eight hours, you hold him over. You don't hold the guy over who did 16, who's volunteering this day, um, because what happens is when you work 24, you have to give them the next day off. So there's some um, manipulation, I believe, going on down to the facility level and, and even down to the watch commander level where we need to address those issues. No one should be working more uh, than, than eight hours a day, but if they do, we need to even out the required mandatory overtime as much as possible. Um, but at the same time, we need to fill the positions. Now I'm willing to work with UPW to sit down to come up with solution, but it can't be pay the guy more money to stay home. That, that, that just can't be. Um, I'm willing to work with them to figure out how can we provide a better working environment for their members who are our employees. I'm willing to do that. But I don't think UPW has solutions to that problem, but I'm willing to sit down and work with them and brainstorm to find out. I'm willing to work with even the folks who came here who had clearly had misinformation about COVID because I didn't work for Nolan Espenda. I wasn't there when COVID first started. I came there because the facility was, because PSD was on fire and because at the time the facility leadership wasn't doing what they were supposed to do. As a result of that, we did remove a warden because of issues of concern.
as we talk about uh, this workforce and how many you need, the coverage, I want to sp ask a few questions about this audit that, that came out last summer that mm -hmm. talked about the shift relief factor, uh, some formula that has not apparently changed in 50 years. Um, and the audit in one section says problems here starts at the top where we found that DPS administration has not implemented processes and procedures governing data collection and has not made uh, a determination of a properly supported shift relief factor a priority. Until the department does so, future requests, unsupported or credible data will likely be disregarded. So essentially it points to people at your level mm -hmm. are not paying attention to coming up with this new formula that ultimately can help you get to the root of some of the causes of your lack of staffing at mm -hmm. your facilities. How are you going to address this? Okay, so a, a couple of things I want to clear up. Uh, Max Otani made a comment to the auditor staff. They asked him about the Schifferty factory. He, he did not say that it wasn't important or that it wasn't critical. What he said was he had other more important things to worry about, which was trying to get COVID under control at the time. So the shift relief factor currently is now 1.65. The problem we have is we don't have enough staff showing up consistently to do an analysis to figure out how much staff we, we how many more staff we need because of the FMLA and because of the abuses. Now, um, they indicated we should use the NIC model, right? However, when Mr. Hoffman contacted several jurisdictions regarding the NIC model, and he can come up here and testify to that. They did, a lot of them didn't use the NIC model because each jurisdiction comes up with a shift relief factor based on their own experience, their own number of positions that are concluded, uh, posts that are critical, that are red or black, that have to be filled. That's how you come up with the shift relief factor based on the number of posts you have and the size facility. Some posts you might only need uh, once a week, which is for deliveries. Another post you might only need for five days a week because it's a, it's a near office post. Uh, the posts you need seven days a week are like medical, food service, housing officers, tower, perimeter. So you got it. So each jurisdiction has their own experience, and that's how they come with the shift relief factor. Now, uh, I'm willing again to work with UPW uh, to try to get guys to do a pilot project. And I mentioned this to Kalani Warner uh, when I met with him that we can start the facility and do a pilot project, but we need to have the guys come to work with enough consistency so we can see. Um, how many staff we need. But right now we have so many people taking FMLA. I'll give you a case in point. Almost all of the ACOs at HCCC have approved FMLA. Now, percentage wise, we have the most ACOs on FMLA in the country of any jurisdiction. So clearly there are abuses there. But from my standpoint, from an employer standpoint, the FMLA is between the employer and the doctor. Once the doctor approves it, there's nothing we can do. We have to abide by it and let the person off when they say they have these issues. And at UPW can then step back and say, well, hey, it's not between us. But really it is because we got to figure out why are the guys, when I say guys, I mean the female corrections officers too, why are they not wanting to come to work? And some of the reason is this, and I'll just put it out there. They know that they can take and call in sick for two days. They know we're so short staffed, we're gonna call them on their days off. They come on their day off and work 16, that's equivalent to 24. They just made up any time they had to leave without paying. So that's the system itself. There's, the system itself is faulty. We need to try to fix that. Can I just kind of you know throw this up because we're short staffed in many different jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictional areas and mm -hmm. within the city and county of Honolulu, I think part of what they started looking at, you know, for um, critical service areas and uh, types of programs where you really need to maximize the coverage you have, they're doing pilot projects, you know, where they're experimenting with four day, 10 hour shifts or mm -hmm. different kinds of shifts. And I think even for the lifeguards and, you know, ocean safety folks, mm -hmm. all of these are high intensity, high stress, you know, really essential services kinds of positions. And it would seem that for corrections, the same is true, that maybe a different combination of both incentives as well as um, 
working condition adjustments need to be examined that mm -hmm. are sort of separate and apart from you know what has traditionally been the case. Mm -hmm. Has that ever been part of the discussion with uh, UPW? Um, there were some discussions from the commission of going to, they were going to make a recommendation for 12 hour shifts. And I believe uh, Christian Johnson met with UPW regarding that. My position was, I'm willing to consider it, but we still need to have enough people coming to work to do the analysis to see if we can do it. Because what happens is, if you go to 12 hour shifts, then somebody works 24. Under the contract, you have to give them the next day off, no matter what. So are we exacerbating the problem by doing that? So again, as, a, as the employer, I will then sit down with UPW and D-Herd and come up with something, but we have to have the guys, enough guys come to work consistently at a facility to do a pilot so we can do the analysis to see if this is going to work. I'm willing to go to 12-hour shifts or 10-hour shifts if it's going to work. Okay, but so if the um, bargaining representative is willing to explore and find out from their members whether or not some sort of alternative was possible, then your department would be willing to we pursue would sit, we would sit examining down with, you know, the with, feasibility. Correct. We would sit down with UPW and DHERD, because DHERD negotiates for the state. That's a negotiable item. Because and I'm willing to enter into an MOU and MOI with them. In a way, I think for all essential services, you know, it, because these are high stress areas, yeah. a lot of burnout, a lot of uh, different conditions that affect uh, longevity and uh, retention, mm -hmm. It's almost like we have to re-examine, you know, how we package whatever the working conditions and benefits are going to be. I, I don't disagree. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, going back to this audit, they said that the public safety took a step forward with the, your, this program called Kamakani. Uh, but the program has kind of fallen flat because it's still uh, manually input it, right? And it showed a picture of something, I don't know what this looks like, this time card or something mm -hmm. uh, here manually maintained, the information on here is inconsistent, you know, various prisons may have good records, others might not have good records, uh, much of this information is inaccurate. Uh, I know the response from public safety was not enough staffing to get all the proper information. And I'll give you that, but I also look at your budget request for this year. On the administration side, you have requests for eight new people. Are any of these eight new people going to be working on Kamakani and start to like get better data for you? I believe those eight new positions are going to the Intake Service Center. Okay, so that would... That, that would not, that would, that's not in the facilities. Well, it's in the facilities, but it's not uh, leave, leave, leave and records and leave keeping. That's from a project that they're funding the positions that were actually, um, I think we got like three years ago, I'm not sure. But th that's what those positions were. Those were Intake Service Center. Those are not for the um, time and attendance clerks. Okay, so help me understand, how are you gonna to get to getting personnel to take care of getting better data for Kamakani so we can get to better outcomes, better measurements from uh, on, on the workforce side? Okay, so we explained to the auditor that the Kamakani report was meant to be a management tool for the facilities. It wasn't meant to collect the data that to the detail they were talking about. So in talking with Senator Coit, because she asked me about this, um, what we told, what I told them we're willing to do, and I'm still willing to do this, is you have what's called the daily sheet. Uh, the guys come in um, where you assign them to a post. So under the auditor's um, analysis, a guy comes in, there's an there's a unscheduled transport. So this position is vacant, we move that person to transport. But that position is not vacant for the whole time. And my understanding was there was some issue of they want us to count that position as vacant, but it's not. So what I agreed to do was to go down to the detail level of the individual post assignments. And that's the data that we would get. And we can do that. And it is time consuming, but we can do it. I want to shift gears and talk about the testimony submitted by the Women's Prison Project, Linda Rich's testimony. Mm -hmm. Bob, she points out the fact that Hawaii has the most women incarcerated of any state in the United States um, and says that the Department of Public Safety was opposed to the creation of a Women's Correctional Implementation Commission, which would be helpful in getting that number down. Why did you oppose that? I, I personally didn't oppose it and I want to make it clear that the, the, the female population represents about 13% of, of our overall population. 
statewide. That's pretrial and sentence felon population. Um, if 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 there is a push to divert um, females from prison, it, there should be a an effort to divert all offenders from prison. Meaning, we shouldn't just focus on females. We should focus on male offenders too. To be fair, I am willing to look at all avenues available to do jail diversion because, as I mentioned earlier. Um, our jails are overcrowded with some people who shouldn't be in jail. We're spending between $247 and $258 a day on people in jail who shouldn't be there. We have people in jail with $15, $25, $50 a bail. That makes no sense to me. However, we are required to take everybody that's sent to us. So I'm willing to work with the judiciary, the prosecutors, the public defender's office, the women's project on jail diversion, but it, it should be across the board because the bigger bang for the buck is the 87%, but we should treat everybody equally if we're gonna look at jail diversion. Well, some might argue that you are gonna try and bite off more than you can chew. So if you wanna be successful, maybe you focus on the women, see success there, maybe get best practices there, and then go focus on the 87%. No, we could, I just don't wanna focus on a single uh, sex. I think, if, yeah, you're right. We could focus on the smaller entity first, but I just don't wanna focus on just that and not do anything for this large group. I think whatever we do, we should try to do across the board. And you're right, we can do lessons learned on the smaller group and maybe have better outcomes on the larger group. That is correct. And the Women's Prison Project also pointed out two, two other things that they have some level of pause on. Them. One was uh, you withholding funds for their education program. And the other was uh, for you also not providing a million dollars that was appropriated for the Women's Work Furlough Program. And so they believe that you have not been supportive of education and the women's furlough program. Uh, so I'm unaware of, of any non-support for those projects. What we did recently do was cancel a solicitation um, for services from Lauren Walker's group. Uh, that's the only thing I'm aware of. In fact, I advocated to the Lieutenant Governor to give us additional money. That's why in our budget, I think we have $2 million in the budget to do work furlough statewide, because I want to improve not just work furlough for women here on Oahu, we want to improve it statewide across the board. And that money is in our budget now. So I don't think that's a true statement. Okay. I'll ask Ms. Rich about that on another conversation. Sure. Um, Members, any further questions? Yes, Senator Alipaka. Just a follow-up comment to some of the line of questioning from Senator Fukunaga. Um, you know, UPW did work with the county under paramedics to adjust their schedule for for to 12, 12 hour shifts for mm -hmm. two to four days a week. So I think the union would be open to working with you, you know, in terms of a pilot program. Sure. Um, to see how we can address the issues of staff shortage and you know, overtime or whatever that may be. As am I. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Members, any further questions? If not, we're going to break briefly prior to taking our vote. <coughs> Thank you for your patience. We're reconvening the Committee on Public Safety and Intergovernmental and Military Affairs on this uh, three o'clock agenda. We have GM 516. Well, this is for the director of the department, seven, five, five, one, five, one, seven, I'm sorry, 517, for the confirmation to the director of the Department of Public Safety, the gubernatorial nominee, uh, Tommy Johnson. Uh, this is a directorship and a, and, a, and a department that is very, very unique, where you don't have any other director that has to always be on standby 24-7, 365 days out of the year, looking over the operations and making sure that the community is safe. And as uh, Mr. Johnson had kind of conveyed to us, uh, the public really focuses only on the occasional 
uh, mm. escapes or bad things, but 99.9% of the time, things are, are done and done well there. That's not to ignore the commentary by the rank and file ACOs who have continuous heartburn, but in recent memory, I don't know of any director that they fondly fell in love with. So mm. it's not one of those situations where it's an easy situation to, to resolve, but I believe that uh, uh, Tommy Johnson will earnestly come to some hopeful res resolution. I appreciate the fact that he's already reached out and is going to address some of the comments and suggestions and concerns expressed by his rank and file members of, of the Department of Public Safety. And, you know, just in my dealings with you, Mr. Johnson, you've always been responsive, you've always been honest. Uh, and, and forthcoming. You tell me what you can do, and you tell me what you can't do. And I respect the fact that you can't solve all of uh, TPS's uh, troubles. Um, you, sometimes they're almost insurmountable to try and please everybody there. So it's with that kind of understanding and, and true belief in your earnest efforts that you're going to uh, make things better. Uh, and, and I've seen already that uh, with regard to your your uh, recruitment classes, you, you've made great strides just in three or four months in your capacity there to ramp up and fill all the pukas that need to be filled. But I do also agree that uh, United Public Workers is got to take a different approach to their work ethic and the way they go about doing business in protecting the community and, and overseeing uh, the inmates that they, they oversee. Um, to hope that you will take into account the women's, sorry, that, that group that Linda Rich was in, involved in and, and really help and maybe focus on helping to get Hawaii from that unenviable position of being the highly, most highly incarcerated uh, state for, for women. And, and we need to knock, knock, knock that down. And maybe from there, your successes will boil over to the men, the 87% of the clientele that you have to deal with there. So we, I have talked to, to my members and we would all like to uh, con convey um, our support for you and advice and consent on your nomination. Members, any discussion? If I may. Senator. Okay. So. No, thank you very much and thank you for being here, you know, director and answering the tough questions and everything. But I think my views are kind of summed up in the testimony of the Women's Prison Project. You know, I think that there was, the issues they raised were not addressed on point. And I also, you know, was concerned about the fact that as the director, you know, you've done operations, you've been a deputy, you've been working with these issues and they've been systemic for years, but as the director, you need to lead on really important legacy projects, new facilities. The Maui facility, for instance, needs leadership and vision and an ability to actually get it done and set deliverables so that a new facility here in Oahu will actually come to fruition. And so because of that and those concerns, I'm gonna support the recommendation of the chair to advise and consent to the floor. However, I'm going to do it with reservations because I think that you need to address these things and hopefully you will work with the emails you showed us and address them on point so that when it comes to a floor vote that these things you know, will be followed up on and you can see that. And then I think the body will probably support you from there on. But I just send that as I've done before to basically say, we'd like to, I'd like to see these issues addressed, especially since you're gonna be the director now of the new this new agency. So thank you again. Thank you, Chair. Any further comments? Mm -hmm. If not, Senator Lefonti, I vote yes. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to advise and consent on GM 517. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Fukunaga. Aye. Senator McKelvey with reservations. with reservations. Senator Awa is excused. Mr. Chair, recommendations adopted. Thank you very much, members. We are adjourned.